Governor Hickenlooper and Luis Benitez, thank you both so much for doing our show. It's really an honor to be with you guys. And uh, thanks for great having to be us here in Denver and in the great state of Colorado. We've really enjoyed our time here. I know all Coloradans know all about you, but for those that don't know, I just find it fascinating. I mean, you were a geologist. Uh, you were the mayor of Denver. Uh, you started a brewery. Uh, you're a musician. We just found that. Not out. really. <laughs> I, they say I couldn't keep a job. <laughs> Well, and you're a great outdoorsman, I know that as well. And so I want to start with asking you about the uh, Office of Recreation that you started here, and you got Luis involved. So what was the impetus for that? Well, the, uh, our idea is we wanted to celebrate our, our public lands, our outdoor, uh, our out here, uh, outdoor vigor. Yeah. And so uh, actually, to be honest, Utah had, had opened an Office of Outdoor Recreation, uh, but they were having trouble with the guy. There was just some friction, and we thought, that's a great idea that we can do even better. Now, of course, the only way you can do something like that better is to find somebody who's incredible. <laughs> and so we were lucky uh, to find, and it's only maybe a dozen times in my life where the exact right person comes into the right job at the right moment. Well, there you go. And so let me ask, Luis, how's it going? He hit the nail right on the head. Obviously, what we focus on here is just the health and well-being of a significant portion of our economy. So when you talk about the health of forests and the health of our waterways, yeah. you're really talking about a significant portion of the jobs that we create here, the economy that we have here, and you don't necessarily need to be involved with the outdoor industry to be passionate about all these things. Right. So to be responsible for some of that oversight and the care and feeding of such an amazing industry in such an iconic state, it's, it's kind of humbling. As you know, our program is called America's Forest, so, and we have really enjoyed uh, the Colorado forest, I must say. And uh, we're also focusing on water quality, so I'd love for you both to speak uh, about the nexus of forests here in Colorado and what it means to water quality. When you talk about waterways and you talk about the ecosystem and the health of our forests, I mean, we're in a perfect spot to talk about the value add to the economy. I mean, this ski line focuses on utilizing pine beetle wood, yes. a wood that anybody else would look at and say, it's done, there's no further use or no further service. And I would argue that Colorado captures both the entrepreneurs in this space and the innovation for something like that. When you consider our waterways that go through a lot of our tiny, iconic mountain towns, you're starting to see river parks that have stand-up paddleboard surf waves. If I would have told you five years ago that you could buy an inflatable surfboard and go surf on a mountain creek, you probably would have told me I was nuts. But here we have a multi-million dollar economy that is helping grow the economy in these small towns. When Luis is talking about the passion for the outdoors, I mean, Colorado has so many young people and they've got a passion for outdoor recreation, but they've also got a passion for beer. We're in a, a place that's Cheers. Yeah. 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 for that one. Um, but we also are a place with that, that uh, has a real passion for, uh, for music, and, and there's also a real passion for water. And, and that, those passions are what create community, they create energy, uh, and they create an economy. And ever since we've kind of had this, this kind of magic, and it, it does it, it comes almost out of the outdoors. We've had more entrepreneurs come here, more businesses start. Uh, we've been talking about the outdoors, about water, day yeah. in and day out. And you know, we're, we have 2.3% unemployment now. We're the lowest, really? lowest state in the, Amer in, in the entire United States, and there are only four states in history that have ever gotten down to 2.3%. And I would argue that it's paying attention to the water and, and, and the forests and the outdoor recreation is a big driver. That's an impressive figure. That is really amazing. I look at the, you know, how we are uh, changing our attitude to, towards all these uh, environmental challenges, and water is such a good one that uh, we are continuously trying to figure out ways to be more con conservation minded. Uh, city of Denver, basically Denver water uh, supplies about one quarter of domestic water, of do one quarter of the whole state. Unbelievable. And when I first got elected, they always said, well, we've got our senior water rights, we don't care about the rest of it. And luckily the mayor gets to a point, the five, you know, the, the, the five board members of, of Denver water, and we put conservation in there with each person. I have three interviews with them. I'd, get the, I'd make sure I knew what their DNA was. And now, Denver Water is one of the foremost conservation-oriented utilities in the, in the country. In the first five years, we cut per capita consumption by 20%. And that, when you start creating that cultural shift, is when good things really happen. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the challenges that, that come with trying to maintain that healthy forest. We have had some uh, tough 
wildfires here, the Haman fire, 2002. I think it was the Buffalo Creek fire back in 96. And uh, tell me about the restoration. How do you deal with it after the fact that it's happened and you, and you have to deal with that in terms of uh, restoring the land? Uh, talk about that a little bit. To a certain extent, uh, wildfires are a natural part of the cycle. And, and in some places, we've worked so hard to make sure there are no small-scale wildfires yes. that when we, we have so much fuel that when we have a fire, it, just, it, it, go, it burns hotter, goes faster, yeah. and goes farther than it would go under normal, natural conditions. But you know, we've had these cycles of wildfires you know, back in 1910, or I think it was 1912, with a big burn. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Egan wrote that wonderful <clears throat> book. So we've seen this before, but this does seem to be more pervasive on a longer scale than anything we've ever seen before. Yeah. And when you get these really hot fires, it is hard. You have to kind of, in some cases, if you leave the beetle kill up and, and it goes a few years and it falls down and then you get a fire, they burn so hot that they almost sterilize, yeah. almost completely sterilize the soil. So you have to, to, you have to intentionally revegetate. Usually forests will come back pretty quickly on their own. Yeah, well, I, I, there has been a lot of replanting and restoration going on. I know that. You know, and, and I would argue, um, yeah. to finish that point, yeah. that when it comes to that reforestation and that revegetation, you know, when you have to find a way to teach the next generation about conservation and stewardship, and you have to find a way to help them understand the importance of that whole ecosystem and cycle that the governor was describing, to be able to get school kids out to help with some of that reforestation work. You know, one of the lucky parts about living in Colorado is how strong our nonprofit sector of our industry is. And so when tragedies like this occur, even though there is a natural rhythm to them and they do have a place in our ecosystem, to be able to have an opportunity to teach the next generation about why it's so important to get back out there and reforest some of these areas and what it means in terms of the life cycle of the forest, the wood, the riparian environments, the watershed, Sheds. It really is a unique opportunity that I would argue Colorado does a really great job of capitalizing on. I want to bring up um, a, a subject that I think uh, all of America faces, but especially Colorado and especially here in the metro Denver area, and that is growth. Uh, you're experiencing incredible growth here. You know, it's, it's just amazing. I, I come from Georgia. Atlanta has a similar problem. But I would just like for you to talk about that a little bit and, and how to offset some of the challenges that come along, comes along with that growth. So we have grown, and I was part of that. You know, I got laid off as a geologist back in the 80s. I opened this brew pub in 1988 in downtown, what's called now Lodo, lower downtown. Yeah. Right across the train station, our rent was $1 per square foot per year. Mm. And, and in 1991, I bought the building for $11 a square foot. <laughs> now that whole region is jammed. It's full of apartment buildings and condos, but there were five or six of us kind of, you know, we were small scale real estate develop developers and we wanted to create a community where you could walk to work, not have traffic jams, and really have urban density. So when I got elected mayor, one of the first things I did was go out and build a relationship with all the suburban mayors, and we got all the, I mean, the suburban mayors are almost all Republicans, and I was a Democrat, and usually the city and the suburbs hate each other. They're always fighting over businesses and citizens. And I said, that's crazy. If we work together, uh, and so we started working together for about a year, a year and a half, and we got all 34 mayors to unanimously su support a four-tenths of a sales tax increase mm -hmm. to build what we call fast tracks, 122 miles of new track, uh, so that people didn't have to get in their cars. People could begin to get in, in denser concentrations around all these stations, right? We had uh, uh, this planned urban developments. And it's transformed Denver. Denver used to be one of the most sprawling places ever, yeah. and each year it's getting denser and denser and denser. And that's, that's really the hope of the future, is you want people to live in urban areas that generally emit work, uh, less pollution, less carbon, but, uh, but they, they go out into these outdoor recreational opportunities and, and appreciate the wilderness, right? Yeah, and I would argue that that's really the question that's in front of us right now with this immense growth. People are coming here because they want a piece of what we have. Right. And what we have 
is this iconic outdoor landscape all around the city. And so one of the questions that we ask ourselves a lot is, what is that ethic, that wilderness ethic, that we're imparting to tourists? Because nine times out of 10, you got a really good shot of somebody coming here, falling in love with the place, and wanting to move here in some capacity, either personally or professionally. So if they're coming here, and I think if we're asking the right questions about what kind of an ethic we're imparting to citizens that have been here for a long time, guests to our state, people that are just moving here, to understand really what it means to be a Coloradan and how special it is to protect some of these resources. So yes, growth is amazing and it's immense. And I think we're starting to have the right kind of conversation around making sure that the people come here know the things that we hold to be most important. And I think that above all else really lends to a blended economy and it lends to a really healthy and vibrant society. And I know you're an environmentalist and you care about these issues and climate change is a real issue of our time, probably the issue of our time. So let's talk about that a little bit, the importance of Colorado's forest uh, sequestering that carbon. Sure, and, and you know, I think one of the, the solutions that we haven't quite gotten our arms around, there, there's a word called topophilia, which mm -hmm. most people have never heard, but topophilia means love of place. And most people love where they are. Not everybody, and we move around a lot, but there is, for most people, a strong love of place. And once you love a place, then you're gonna pay attention to, to the environmental circumstances right. and, and the consequences of your actions, or lack of action. Mm -hmm. And that's where, when you look at carbon sequestration, and you know, each person, plant a tree in your yard. Plant on the south side of your house so as that tree grows taller, it gives you shade and you don't turn the air conditioners on in the summer. I mean, these are small actions that make, you know, their, 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 their effects are, are magnified so significantly over time. That's right, that's right. Well, listen, cheers to that, my friends. And thank you both again so much for being with us. It's been a real joy.